Some facts about show business are true no matter the decade, and one of those facts is that performers can run into hard, dark times. The 1950s weren't all that glamorous for TV stars. Is any form of entertainment serious enough to warrant a congressional investigation? It may sound absurd, but a 1950s TV scandal attracted the attention of America's federal legislative branch. Among the most popular genres in the early days of television, according to history, was the quiz show. An import from radio, quiz shows moved from fun stunts to big money after 1954 when the Supreme Court ruled that such prizes wouldn't run afoul of gambling laws. The $64,000 question, 21, Dotto, and others put questions to players with stakes of handsome sums. Beyond the appeal of the game itself, charismatic contestants with outstanding luck and knowledge won audiences' hearts, but wins and losses weren't entirely due to chance or skill. Double Jeopardy, we are fine. I don't, I don't think you understand how Jeopardy works. Right, I'm sorry. What is we're fine? It was a widespread practice among quiz shows to rig the game, albeit in different ways. Some shows deliberately tried to knock players out of the competition, while others threw the game based on whatever was best for ratings. The scale of rigging in the genre came to light when a former Dotto contestant revealed that the show gave away answers. That was Congress's cue to step in. According to PBS, their investigation didn't end with much in the way of punishment. Sure, it may have violated the spirit of fair game, but rigging a game show wasn't exactly illegal. However, Congress did make it so in time for the next decade through an amendment to the Communications Act. Anyone who watches a sitcom, soap opera, or HBO movie probably thinks it's a skip-by-skip -skip replay of real life. That isn't entirely true. Artifice is baked into fiction by its nature, but television can reflect certain realities of society, even if unintentionally. Take the 1950s, for example. Show business wasn't the most diverse profession in the 1950s. In assessing the TV output of the decade, Alan Nadell argued that the new medium made things worse. In his book, Television in Black and White America, Race and National Identity, Nadell said that the limited number of networks, emphasis on racial conformity and absence of diversity, reinforced an image of American life that excluded non-white populations. However, it's also important to notice the strides made during the 1950s by non-white actors. As Paul Keene writes in the New Haven Register, yes, the 1950s were unfriendly to women, ethnic minorities, and LGBTQ people, but that doesn't mean there wasn't progress. Keene also found examples of progress in various programs, from the mixed marriage on I Love Lucy to depictions of women doctors and native groups in Death Valley days. Television doesn't offer the most secure employment for actors. Few pilots make it onto the air, and few series last long enough to find an audience. If a show has the good fortune to become a hit, a star might have reason to think that they'll have a steady job for a few years. But even in that situation, show business can be fickle. There's no business like show business. Consider the example of Guy Williams. For the baby boomer generation, Williams' dashing smile brought California's legendary outlaw Zorro to life through the 1957 television program of the same name. Zorro was produced by Walt Disney, who offered the series to ABC as part of a deal to secure financing for Disneyland. Once a park was up and running, Williams and the rest of the cast put in personal appearances during Zorro days, and the series was a hit for viewers. Williams delighted in playing Zorro and expected to be back in the mask within months after the second season ended. But according to Zorro Unmasked, ABC was no longer willing to put up money for expensive shows like Zorro when they could produce their own content in-house at a better price. Disney, which found the network's creative notes stifling, considered Zorro a lost cause. To Williams' great frustration, the show was canceled. The demarcation line between film and television is blurred over the decades, and a casual look at entertainment headlines in 2022 suggests that the latter medium is on the upswing while the former is spiraling. But that isn't anything new. Since TV first became a major media force in the 1950s, critics and observers have been declaring it the killer of Hollywood. According to history, film historians generally date the golden age of the studio system, where creative talent was under contract to a studio that controlled vital distribution chains between 1930 and 1945. In the immediate post war years, some of the largest studios invested in the growing television medium, but a Supreme Court ruling that cost studios control over movie theaters also stifled efforts to control TV stations. As the independent networks attracted fresh talent or established names subjected to the Hollywood blacklist, things began to change. The convenience of TV added to the snowball and convinced audiences to stay at home, which ultimately began the collapse of the studio system. The same held true in Britain, where major film companies let bitterness over the competition affect their judgment. Peter Cushing told Wogan that studios didn't want to hire actors who worked in TV like him because of the hits they were taking at the box office. The one exception was Hammer, who figured that Cushing's popularity would be an asset to its low-budget effort, The Curse of Frankenstein. They figured right, because it proved to be the first of many Hammer horror pictures to star the actor. Wouldn't you understand you're in real danger? 
It can be a wonderful thing to be a Hollywood legend, depending on what the legend is about, at least. Actor George Reeves spent most of his adult life as an actor, and he brought Superman to life from 1951 to 1958. But it was the tragic circumstances that came after the adventures of Superman that unfortunately brought him his greatest notoriety. Reeves came into the world as George Kiefer Brewster in 1914. He became a Bessalo by adoption and changed his name to George Reeves when Warner Brothers offered him a contract in 1938, according to Turner Classic Movies. But Reeves rarely got credit for his studio work, which was often in supporting parts for beat pictures. He harbored doubts about his chances when he took on the part of Superman and Superman and the Mole Man in the 1950s. It was another B picture, but Reeves' physique convinced the producers to cast him as the Man of Steel on TV. The Adventures of Superman brought Reeves stardom, but the public's identification of him in the part was so strong that he was unable to find other work. His salary was poor, and he struggled with alcohol and romance. In 1959, he was found dead of a gunshot wound just as his personal life seemed to be recovering. While initially ruled a suicide, circumstantial evidence suggested murder. The unsolved case continued to attract fascination, and it was the subject of 2006's Hollywood Land. In the age of streaming and online video, advertising is taking a different shape from the minutes-long blocks of commercials of traditional television. But whether it's a pop-up on YouTube or a slickly produced TV spot, ads share the same goal, to inspire viewers to buy whatever's being promoted. Huh. I've never made it this far in the ad before. <laughs> Such consumerism has long had its critics, but the intensity of advertising in the name of consumption today can be traced in part to the post-war boom that saw television rise. According to the National Museum of American History's Bering Center, TV became big at the same time that America's living standards increased. This meant that franchising became a popular business practice, and shifting social mores opened new markets. Advertising firms who were looking to expand in light of this newfound prosperity turned to television. In some cases, this meant putting the bill for TV shows. You bet your life was directly sponsored by DeSoto Plymouth dealers. This practice faded by the end of the decade as networks took firm control over advertising time. The ads kept coming, and the glow of the post-war boom only gradually eroded by economic downturns in the ensuing decades. Another factor in the 50s advertising was the Cold War. Author Richard Allen Schwartz argued in Cold War Culture that TV producers projected affluence largely because viewers liked it, but it also unconsciously served as a cultural weapon against the Spartan oppressive image of communism. The Hollywood blacklist didn't only affect film stars. In the 1950s, America's favorite redhead found herself branded a red. According to The Wrap, when Lucille Ball registered to vote in 1936, she put herself down as a communist. Ball claimed that she did so for her grandfather's sake. His friend was running for city council as a communist. Ball's name later appeared in connection with the California State Branch of the Communist Party, something she said was done without her knowing, and she never renewed her membership after it expired in 1938. Ball was interviewed about her possible links to communism by the FBI in 1952, where she denied any interest or involvement, and later gave secret testimony to that effect before the House Un-American Activities Committee. She considered herself in the clear and went on with her business, chiefly starring in the hit sitcom I Love Lucy. But in 1953, gossip columnist Walter Winchell branded Ball a communist, creating a media frenzy. Ball and her husband Desi Arnaz were quick to respond. Despite Ball's terror the possible effects of the story on her career, she reported to work, where she was given the opportunity to refute the claims. It proved unnecessary. The chairman of the House Un-American Activities Committee personally cleared her name before the American public, but the FBI might not have been convinced, according to the Washington Post. They maintained a file on Ball for years. You can know your lines, hit your marks, and have an indefinable charisma that draws in viewers and brings a character to life, but that's no guarantee you'll be able to hang on to your role in a TV series. You're fired. Even a star can find themselves cast aside if the network so decides. Stardom can't even guarantee an explanation when things don't work out. The Lone Ranger has appeared on radio, comics, serials, and film. The 1950s audiences knew him best through the work of actor Clayton Moore. Throughout the decade, Moore donned the mask, mounted his horse Silver, and rode alongside Jay Silverheels Tonto to the William Tell Overture on the Lone Ranger TV series. According to the Los Angeles Times, Moore enjoyed the park. He liked working with Silverheel and earned extra money for doing his own horse stunts. But for a brief period during the series run, he was replaced by actor John Hart. In his obituary for Hart, the Chicago Tribune said that Moore was replaced over money, but in his memoir, I Was That Masked Man, Moore denied that he had any dispute with producers over money, merchandising, or any other business consideration, writing, No one connected with the Lone Ranger ever told me why I had been fired, and I never asked. Moore professed the same ignorance as to why he was eventually rehired. Imagine having to share an office with a co-worker you don't like. 
Now imagine that the work requires the two of you to pretend to be happily married day in and day out for years. That can very easily be an actor's lot in life. It's arguably a mark of their talent that performers who can't stand one another can convey the opposite to viewers on a consistent basis. But this can make for an awkward atmosphere on the set of a television series. Jess Oppenheimer was the creator of I Love Lucy. In his memoir in the series, written with his son Greg, he recalled that a second couple on the show, the Mertzes, did not get along in real life, writing in Laughs, Luck, and Lucy, How I Came to Create the Most Popular Sitcom of All Time, Vivian Vance couldn't stomach Bill Frawley. Hey boss, it's a dame here to see you. <laughs> While things were pleasant initially, Vance was reportedly upset that she could be so convincing as the wife of Frawley, who was many years her senior. Frawley responded by pitching insults his character would throw at Vance or refusing to cooperate with any suggestion she made. Oppenheimer was regularly pressed into service as a mediator between them. 